Welcome to the second of two videos for this week. This one is on the Protestant Reformation. And there's three things we're going to talk about. The Protestant Reformation, the English Reformation, and the Catholic Reformation. So let's get started. What are the causes of the Reformation? Well, the Reformation is going to be the split in the church, and it does not happen overnight. Now, one of the big things that happens is the Black Plague or the Black Death. Remember, the clergy died in large numbers during the Black Death because they were the ones who were supposed to you know, take the last rites. They're the ones who were supposed to help the poor, help the sick. And the clergy are going to be affected very much by the Black Plague. Then you have the struggle of church versus state that we've been talking about. Is it the kings that have power? Is it the pope that has power? Is it the bishops, the landlords? Who is it? On top of that, we get this event called the Babylonian Captivity. It lasts from 1305 until 1314. Basically, the French king is going to order the military to kidnap Pope Clement V. Pope Clement V is forced to live in the French city of Avignon, and that creates controversy on whether Clement V is still Pope or not. Eventually, a Pope named Gregory the Ninth, I'm sorry, not Gregory the Ninth, Gregory the Eleventh, is going to move back to Rome on January 17th of 1377. And suddenly, we have a new pope elected to Avignon named Benedict the 13th. Now we have not one, but two popes. One's in Rome, Gregory the 11th. One's in Avignon, Benedict the 13th. Gregory is going to be replaced by Boniface the 9th. Boniface the 9th will be replaced by Innocent the 7th. So we have a succession of popes in Rome. Benedict the Thirteenth will be replaced by Alexander the Fifth. Then Alexander the Fifth is replaced by John the Twenty Third. So we have a succession of popes in Avignon. So now we have not just two popes, but two entire lines of popes. So there's a real question on who is the right pope, who is not the right pope, and who should you listen to? This whole thing isn't going to be solved until the year 1417 at the Council of Constance. At the Council of Constance, there's not one, not two, but three popes that are there. Benedict the Thirteenth, who never actually quit, he was just pushed to the side. Clement the Eighth, and John the Twenty Third. All three of those guys go to the Council of Constance, claiming to be the real pope. An election is held. One pope survives the meeting, and it's not any of those three. Is a brand new pope named Martin V. So three popes go in, one pope comes out, and it's not even one of the original three. So that's going to weaken the Catholic Church as well, because people basically say, what the heck is going on here? So some people are going to start speaking up against the church or about problems they see with the church. One of the first to do it is named John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe, he lived from 1328 to 1384, and he's from England. And he basically says that the church should not own property. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that there should be the cult of Mary. Nowhere does it say that there should be saints. And all that stuff should be gone away with. On top of that, he's going to translate the Bible into English, which lets people read for the first time in their native language how messed up the Catholic Church has gotten. Now, Wycliffe is originally supported by people who thought they could get something out of this. Basically, hey, if the church can't own property, maybe I can get it. Uh, the peasants are going to use the words John Wycliffe, and it's going to start a peasant revolt in 1381. And by the time it's all done, John Wycliffe is going to be considered a, uh, a traitor. He's going to become an enemy of the state. And anybody who followed the beliefs of John Wycliffe, known as Lollardy, they're regarded as subversive, and it became a capital crime by 1400 to be 
a believer in John Wycliffe. Now, one of these believers of John Wycliffe was a man named uh, John Hussle. John Hussle. He was the personal confessor to the Queen of England, Queen Anne. Queen Anne was from a place called Bohemia. Her brother was King Wenceslas of Bohemia, and Anne was married to Richard II of England, the same Richard II of England who made it illegal to be a follower of Wycliffe. Well, Queen Anne is a believer in Wycliffe. Queen Anne is afraid that her husband's going to kill her. And so Queen Anne and her personal confessor, Jan Hus, or John Hus, moved back home to Bohemia. John Hus is going to spread these same ideas throughout Bohemia. The church shouldn't own property. There's no such thing as saints. There's no such thing as the cult of Mary. And it catches on like wildfire in Bohemia. He's going to be invited to the Council of Constance. And in 1415, when he arrives at the council, he's guaranteed safety. No, no, we're not going to hurt you. As soon as he gets there, he's arrested, he's put on trial, and he's executed for being a heretic. Now, what were the complaints against the church? Well, there were several. One of them was immorality. A Catholic priest is supposed to be celibate, meaning no sex. And there were children running around that belonged to priests. Many priests lived openly with women, which they weren't supposed to do. They were openly drunk. They were openly gambling, which they weren't supposed to do. Instead of stopping these practices, the Catholic Church just taxed the couple to make their children legitimate and just kind of looked the other way. There's clerical ignorance. These standards of ordination, the standards of being a priest in the early, well, in this part of the Catholic Church, I should say, shockingly low. It's estimated that only about 2% of the clergy could actually understand what was happening during a Catholic service. In other words, 98% of them were faking it until they could make it. This was bad because not only do they not know what they're doing, but as the Bible began to be translated into the everyday languages instead of Latin, more and more people found out, hey, the Catholic Church is just making it up. By 1522, there were 18 different chants of the Bible and 18 different languages realize this is wrong. Then we have clerical pluralism. Sometimes churchmen held several offices at the same time. They just collected the revenue instead of visiting their, per their parishes. For example, somebody might be the priest in charge of a parish in southern France and the, at the same time be the priest in charge of Northern Germany, and they never go to Northern Germany. They just get the money. There are also criticisms that church clergy were just going through the motions. But probably the most complaints came when it came about with indulgences. Whenever I teach this, I tell people that indulgences were get out of hell free cards, just like you might get Monopoly. You could buy forgiveness for things that you have done and you're not truly really sorry. You can buy forgiveness for things you have not yet done but are going to. You can buy forgiveness for people who did something long ago in the past. So, hmm, I robbed a bank today. I, I don't actually feel bad, but I want forgiveness. Here, I'll just buy my get-out-of-hell-free card. Or, hmm, I think I'm going to rob a bank tomorrow. Why don't I buy a get-out-of-hell-free card now while I'm on my way to the bank? Or, my dear Aunt Sally robbed a bank 36 years ago and then died the day after. I'm not sure if she ever made her peace, so I'll buy her way out of sin right now. So you don't actually have to be sorry for your your sin, you just have to have money to wash that sin away. And you don't have to have true penance. And to make it even worse, there were people selling them making piles of money. There were the Fuggers in Augsburg that got one-third commission on each one they sold. You sell 
an indulgence for $30, you keep 10 of it. It's a lot of money people were making off of this. And that's where Martin Luther steps in. Martin Luther is by far the most famous name in this period of Reformation. He wanted to be a lawyer, but he devotes himself to the Christian church after he survives a, a thunderstorm. And just like any other church member of the day, he was originally taught that true repentance doesn't come from any self-inflicted worry or self-inflicted pain. It comes from a change of heart. In other words, you feel bad for what you did, you go do your prayer, you do your confession, and it's all gone. But no matter how many times Martin Luther did his confession, he always felt sinful. Even though he was doing all the right things, he felt, I still haven't been forgiven for my sins. And eventually he's going to come with this groundbreaking idea that says, the idea that salvation does not depend on external observances, but rather simple faith. In other words, you didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to do confession. You didn't have to say your Hail Marys. All you had to do was have simple faith. And he says, this, is a faith, this faith is a gift from God. It cannot be earned. And it becomes known as justification by faith alone. And it's one of the major parts of the Lutheran church today. You don't have to do any action to be forgiven. You just have to believe and ask for forgiveness. He's also going to write a series of complaints about the Catholic Church known as the 95 Theses. He's going to nail these on the door October 31st, 1517, one of the few dates I think everybody needs to know in history. Because whether you're Christian or not, this is a day that changes the world. October 31st, 1517, he puts a list of 95 criticisms he has with the church on the door, and he challenges anybody to come and debate him. Now, these are just, they're going to challenge the Pope. Um, you have to read these for this week, so you may have already read these by the time you watch this, or, I mean, you may never watch this ever from the way the, the viewing numbers look. But the penalty of sin remains as long as the hatred of self, namely till our entrance into the kingdom of heaven, the Pope neither desires nor is able to remit any penalties except those imposed by his own authority or that of the canons. So, Sin, the sin that ever goes away, it is forgiven. The Pope can't damn you to hell. The dying are freed by death from all penalties, are already dead as far as the canon laws are concerned, and have a right to be released from them. In other words, he can't buy an indulgence for the dead because the dead are already gone. 95 things that he basically says, look, Pope, here's my problem. In response for, to the 95 Theses, Luther is going to be declared a heretic, and the church is going to say, we are the sole authority on the Bible. Only the Pope can interpret the Bible, and the church elders will determine what the Catholic Church does and does not do. Luther recognizes two sacraments, baptism and communion. The Catholic Church recognizes seven Luther completely rejects the cult of Mary. Luther rejects the idea of purgatory. Luther rejects the idea of relics. And then Luther also rejects the idea of transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is interesting. In Catholicism at the time, and I think it may actually still happen, I'm not 100% sure, it was thought that the bread and wine uh, used in communion, when it was ingested, would turn into the blood of Christ or the flesh of Christ. And Luther says, no, 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 this does not transform in your body. It is just a representation. Now, for all this trouble, and after being declared a heretic, the Pope is going to ask, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, to capture Luther. But instead, Luther is going to be protected by his friend, Frederick III of Saxony. 
Now, what are the political impacts of what Martin Luther is doing? Well, originally, this was seen as a way to unite Germany. Uh, Germany at the time was made up of dozens of independent little city-states or kingdoms, and people thought that this would unify Germany because it's something uniquely German. Uh, the problem, though, is it has the exact opposite effect. And that's because of something called the Peace of Augsburg. In the Peace of Augsburg, each leader of their individual kingdom got to decide what religion they follow, whether it's Protestant, meaning Lutheran, or Catholic, meaning Roman Catholic. And whatever each German prince decided, all of his followers had to just do that too. So all of these different German princes decided that they're going to be Lutheran or, or Catholic, then all of the people in their kingdom have to do that same thing, and it makes the German princes even more powerful, and we don't get German unification until 1871. We do have John Calvin as well. Uh, he is going to form Calvinism, and Calvinists believe in something called predestination. Now, this used to be a lot more confusing to me than what it is now, so I'm going to try and describe it in a way that makes sense. If you're going to heaven, you are selected at the beginning of time, basically. Uh, you have been either saved or damned before you're ever born, and it's believed all men inherit original sin. God saves some people prior to birth because he's a merciful God, and that's that. Now, people say, well, well if you already know if you're going up or down, um, why don't you just act like an idiot? Well, it's because you don't know if you're one of those that's going up and down. Nothing that you do on earth can change your fate, but it's also believed that if you are somebody who has been predestined to go to heaven, you're going to live a good life. So you want to look good because you're hoping that you're one of the chosen. In Scotland and the United States, Calvinists are known as Presbyterians. In colonial America, Calvinists were known as Puritans or Pilgrims. And Calvinists in France are known as Huguenots. All of those are the same thing in Calvinism. English Reformation. This is all about sex. I mean, let's just be honest. Uh, King Henry VIII, he wants a boy. And the only way to have a boy is to have sex. So the, the reason he wants to have a boy so bad is because the English Civil War, the War of the Roses, has just happened. And King Henry VIII wants to make sure he has a son because he wants to make sure that his heirs will be the monarch and that the war doesn't start again. Uh, it was his dad that won the war, basically. And Henry VIII himself was a second son. His older brother died young, leaving Henry to become the next king. Henry marries somebody named Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon and Henry only have a girl. That girl's name is Mary. And to make it even more confusing, Catherine of Aragon was originally Henry's older brother's wife. And when Henry's older brother dies, Henry marries her. Because Mary never gives him a son, he asks the Pope for annulment. The only way you can annul a marriage is to prove you never had sex. Well, Mary exists, therefore they had sex, so he has to try something different. He says, well, my brother slept with Catherine before I ever did, therefore our marriage is null and void. Well, multiple people came out and said, no, your brother and Catherine never lived together, they didn't sleep together, they didn't speak together, it was basically a marriage in name only. So the next thing that Henry VIII is going to do is go to the Pope and say, Pope, I'm kicking you out of the Catholic Church, and I am going to take over the church on my own. And the first thing he does is he annuls the marriage between he and Catherine. King Henry VIII is going to get married several more times. He marries Anne Boleyn. In 1533, he has her beheaded in 1536, supposedly 
because she is sleeping around. Um, spoiler alert, it's actually King Henry who's doing the sleeping around. But Anne Boleyn gives him another daughter named Elizabeth I. Well, in 1536, after Anne Boleyn is beheaded, he marries Jane Seymour, who was Anne Boleyn's best friend. And Jane Seymour gives Henry the son he wanted, named Edward. But she dies during birth complications a couple days after Edward is born. Henry is still worried about having a second son, so he marries somebody else named Anna Cleves. They get divorced. Then he marries Catherine Howard. Um, he has her beheaded in 1542 because she actually is sleeping around. And then he marries finally somebody named Catherine Parr, and Catherine Parr outlasts and outlives him. So once again, when it comes down to it, this whole English Reformation, it's about sex, needing to have a boy, and then divorce because his wives can't give him a son. So here you go, Catherine of Aragon, who is the mother of Mary, married from 1509 to 1533. They have a, an annulment. Anne Boleyn, 1533 to 1536, she dies of being beheaded. Jane Seymour, mother of Edward, he lives, but she dies. Then you got Anna Cleves, they were only married for a couple of weeks. Catherine Howard, they were married for a little more than a year. And Catherine Parr, they were married until Henry's death in 1547. So, as I said, Henry asked the Pope for permission to divorce. The Pope says no, because he's actually the cousin of Catherine of Aragon. Henry excommunicates the Pope, names himself the head of his new church. And that's important because if he hadn't done that, then people could have gone against him. But if you go against the king, then you're committing treason and you can be killed. Not only that, but Henry's going to dissolve all the Catholic monasteries. He's going to give the land to his friends. That way, the Catholic Church couldn't actually give the land back. And Henry is going to give some power to Parliament in exchange for Parliament to play along. Now, everything about Catholic or about Henry's church is still Catholic, except he's the head of the church instead of the Pope. Today, there are some additional ideas that are more Protestant in his church, but that's going to happen well after Henry's death. Today's Anglican Church does still exist. It is known as the Church of England over in England, or here in the United States, it is known as the Episcopalian Church. And it is very much still mostly Catholic in dogma, meaning the way it works. What happens after Henry VIII dies in uh, 1547? Edward becomes king, but Edward is just a teenager when he becomes king, and he dies before he turns 18. Because he dies before he's 18, his half-sister Mary is going to become queen, and Mary tries to bring Catholicism back. And yes, this is the Mary, better known as Bloody Mary. She basically, she hunts down anybody who helped her dad divorce her mom and kills them, and then she executed something like 300, different, 300 Protestants. Um, she forces England into a war with France. And she marries Philip II, and a Spanish king who is also a Catholic. Now, Queen Elizabeth I, she's going to take over after Mary dies. And she's going to try and find a middle ground between Protestantism and Catholicism. Uh, basically, she's going to be worried about everybody recognizing her as the queen. And she develops something called the Articles of Faith. They're written so broadly that you know, pretty much everybody can go along with them. But you had to, to attend a Catholic, or, I'm sorry, you had to attend a church of the evil service. But if you were a Catholic in privacy in your home, she didn't really care. Elizabeth, Elizabeth did not inquire too closely what she did the rest of the day, provided your loyalty to her was not questioned. So, again, she tried to separate church and state. Uh, she tried and make it so that you could be whatever religion in the privacy of your own home. And for a little while it works, but unfortunately the wars of religion will eventually come home to England as well. 
And then last but not least, we have the Catholic Reformation. And this one's easy. Uh, the Catholics said that they were right. Everybody else was wrong. The Council of Trent meets from 1545 to 1563, where they analyze everything that's happened. And they restate the basic Catholic doctrine. Justification by, justification by faith and good works? Yep. The Bible is not the sole source of authority? Yep. The Pope can interpret the scriptures? Yep. The cult of Mary? Saints, pilgrimages, said transubstantiation, all of that is confirmed. It's almost like the Catholics didn't learn anything. There are two changes that are made, though. Number one, the, well, three changes, really. Number one, they, the leaders of the Catholic Church agree to better educate their clergymen. They will be given training on the services, they'll be given training on the Latin scriptures, etc., etc. New religious orders are created. You've got the Ursuline nuns and the Carmelite nuns who are created. Ursuline nuns are used to train future women. The Carmelite nuns are used to, um, to talk to those who are poor. And then you have the Society of Jesus that's created better known as the Jesuits. The Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, are basically the Pope's stormtroopers. Yes, that is a Star Wars reference in the middle of this lecture. Wherever the Pope needed people to be converted, wherever Palpatine needed the stormtroopers to go, the Jesuits are sent. And the Jesuits are going to forcibly, or involuntarily, depending, make people into Catholics. So the Jesuits go to South America, North America, Africa, Asia, wherever there are bodies to be converted to Catholicism, the Jesuits go. The Jesuits are also going to become confessors to kings, and they will eventually get involved heavily in creating schools and missionary work, but that's not their primary goal at first. Their primary goal is to convert souls to Christianity. Now here you see the end of the semester. We go to the correct class, that's for the US history class. And we are on week seven, the Renaissance and the Reformation. Make sure you get this research essay due by next Monday. Make sure you get this museum review done by next Monday because the research essay, 10% of your grade, the museum review, 10% of the grade. 20% of your grade that's due this week. So please, please, please get it submitted. And if you have any questions, don't be afraid to email. I sit in front of my desk waiting for emails to come in almost all day. So I want to make sure that you do well on this. For next week, we will have a short lecture video on European exploration. And I do highly encourage you to watch that before you take your final exam. Also, for your final exam, every question will be taken from my lecture videos. So if you know anybody taking this class with you and they're not watching the videos, now's a good time to tell them to watch it because that's how you will do well on this test. All right, that's it for this week. Look forward to hearing from you. And good luck on your essay and your museum review. See you later.